Galatians chapter number 6. We're going to begin reading in verse number 1. The Bible says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. We'll stop there. Verse number six, though. So. Doesn't have anything to do with the lesson, but as I was reading it, I think we've mentioned this before. Verse number six, let's, let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Right? That applies to us. Right? The student, if he's got questions, the student, if he feels like the lesson was you know, right on point, tell the teacher. Okay, if you've got a question, ask the pastor. Right? Ask the one that has been communicating unto you what God wants you to hear. I mean, you can always ask God, right? But God gives us people, right? Thankfully, we've got a pastor that's devoted to studying the Word of God, right? And if you got a question about something, he may just give you a little 10-page pamphlet or book or handout that, you know, hey, this has everything you, you know, everything you just talked about, it's in there. And if you got questions after you read it, let me know, right? I'm convinced that Brother Phil has had about half of the books in Dad's office at his house at some point, Right over the past couple of years, because every time he comes in church, he'll smack me on the arm and say, hey, guess what I read this week? And he'll start talking about Oswald Chamber or talk about something else that he'd been reading that week. Right? But when you hunger for, as we talked about last week, wisdom from the Word of God, when you hunger for answers, when a man gets up and preach, and you know he may have the power of God all over him, but at the end of the message, instead of being like some people where you're like, hey, uh, I'm glad that was over, but you're sitting there thinking, man, I could have taken about another eight hours of that. You're like that crowd that was with the Apostle Paul when he preached until midnight. Right? It just wet your whistle. You were just, you know, barely even scratched the surface of your appetite when you come to a man and preach, hey, that's great, boy, can I get more of that? Right? Or, on the other hand, right, because we're supposed to be studied to hold those that teach and preach accountable, to know whether or not what they say is true or not. Right? If a man be overtaken in a fault, somebody may preach or teach something they didn't write. Right? The best way to handle it is if, you know, the pastor goes to him and says, hey, what you, what you taught wasn't right. Right? Then the easy way to do is to say, okay, pastor, I was right. Next week, get up and say, hey, last week, okay, I said something off the cuff. Right? May not have even meant to say it. Didn't know that I said it when I said it. Right, but here's why that's wrong. Go chapter verse. Then hatch is buried. Let's get, let's keep plowing. Right, but that doesn't always happen. But the teached, right, the students are to have an open line of communication to those that teach. Right, pastor, first half of the message I was right there with you, but I I hadn't heard the second half before. Right, that was a little bit different. I thought, where can I go to read more about that? Right? Or, hey, thanks for the message, right on point. I'm going to go back and just meditate on that all day long. Right? If i got questions, I'll let you know. Right? Why? Because God gave the church as a body fitly framed together. Right? If the foot has a question, the hand may be able to answer it. Right? Or if one member says, hey, I need to know more about that, somebody else may say, hey, I was like you. I know exactly where you can read more about that. I got a book by, you know, Chambers or Tozer or any of these other people, or I went and read this chapter in the Bible. Right? That answered all of my questions. Right? What is that a picture of? It is God using His Word to equip everybody in the church. If you know how to tie your shoes, you may be able to help somebody else that doesn't know how to tie their shoes. Right? That's all it is. We're supposed to have the whole armor of God, and if I figured out how to put on the breastplate of righteousness... I may be able to help you with that. But if you've figured out how to have your feet shod with the preparation of peace, I, peace, I may be struggling with that. And you may be the one that can help me. Right? Not because you're more important than the Word of God, but because God has you know, explained that in your life, and you can be used to explain it to somebody else. Right? 
Just a little bit of practice. It has nothing to do with the lesson today. But as I was reading it, God put that you know, thought again into my head. But anyway, verse number one, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. True spirituality, as I said, ye which are spiritual. True spirituality does not judge someone just so that you know, the person that's doing the judging can be elevated. We talked about that a long time ago in the Sermon on the Mount, which took us a whole long time to get through, and we don't have time to go back on judge not, lest ye be judged. Okay, but people quote that a lot, meaning you don't have the right to judge me. Right? Well, I may not be the one judging you. I know what the Word of God says. And this is black and white. I don't have to judge you to know whether or not what you're doing is right or wrong according to God. All judgment's been committed unto Him. Right? But if He judged in His Word that it's wrong, it's wrong. That doesn't give me the right to lord it over you. But if you're spiritual, if you see someone in a fault, well, I know that that's not right. A spiritual one doesn't seek to degrade them, to bring them down. The spiritual one seeks to restore them, to get them back to where spiritually they need to be. Right? Regardless of the last half of the verse, or the last portion of the verse, right? A spiritual person says that person's hurting. That situation that they're in is going to cause them problems. Let's get them back to where they need to be with God. A spiritual person does not embarrass them. Drag it out in front of everybody else. A spiritual it says if ye if a man be overtaken in a fault ye which are spiritual restore doesn't say publicize doesn't say to mock doesn't say to ridicule right what's the one thing that you know 99.9 percent .9 of the missionaries or the preachers or the evangelists the pastors that come by here what is it that they say y'all got a loving church right it's palpable you can feel it when you come that's something different around here it's just that we love people. Not one of the ladies on that, you know, banner trophies of God's grace, Sister Gloria, right? Before Sister Gloria got saved, some of us may not have even wanted to associate with her, right? But God did a work in that woman's life. We're still reaping fruit from, you know, the desires, the prayers that that woman had for our church today, right? Was she super spiritual? No, she just loved Jesus. She never got over the fact that Jesus did for her what the Bible said it would, and she was just thankful for it. Always wanting to do something. But see, we may have judged her before, because we don't know what, just because someone's this way now, we don't know what God can do in that person's life. We don't see the other half of it. But ye which are spiritual, you understand that could be me. In all actuality, I'd probably end up worse. Right, so, one, we don't want that for that person. Spiritual people have charity, right, which is defined as love. We love those. And because we love those that are in a fault, we want to see them restored. But a spiritual person also understands just because it may be in a mess now, maybe a big mess, maybe a little mess, but it's a mess. Just because there's a mess, it doesn't mean that God can't do a work. Right, the unspiritual say, well, God never be able to use that person. Hogwash. Well, God may be able to use them to do this, but not that. There's a lot of people that have gone through Brother Rocky's mission down there, the Crossroads Rescue Mission. You know how many preachers and pastors and associate pastors and Sunday school teachers have come out of that work? Just because one man had a burden to restore those, sometimes they need to get saved, but sometimes they're saved folk to get down there. Their life's been turned upside down. But as a result of someone just saying, come to the end. Don't worry about the cost. Don't worry about the bills. I got it. Right? Like the Good Samaritan. Here's a down payment. If I come back through and it costs more, let me know. We'll foot the bill because we just want to see this one restored. Even if they really don't necessarily want the help. Right? That Jewish person in the Good Samaritan, he wouldn't have spit on the Samaritan. If he was on fire, because he was a half-breed. He said, it doesn't matter if they do it for me. God wants to do it for them, and that's enough for me. We don't look for the repayment on the other. Our repayment's in glory. 
Right? The spiritual person's not looking for the kickback. The spiritual person's looking for that person's life to be changed by the power of God. That's enough for them. And yet, you may take... I wonder how many times this Samaritan had stopped taking care of somebody on the side of the road that had been in a you know, situation. Could have been, had a busted axle on their cart. Right? Could have just been, maybe they was running out of water, he gave them a satchel of water. Right? This person, he bound up his wounds, poured the oil in them, took him to a place where he could rest and recuperate, and said, I'll, I'll foot the bill. I wonder how many of those people went on to have a life that was impacted by that act of charity and kindness. But I also wonder how many people just said, well, back to the usual. Wouldn't have even known the man that stopped and said, weren't appreciative of it, doesn't matter. A spiritual individual's not looking for what we may get. We're doing as Christ would do. Restoring. He came seeking to save that which was lost, to restore them to the position that Adam and Eve once had, where they had fellowship with God. Right? We're not looking at what they may do in the future. It's just what can I do for that person now? But then, oh, by the way, if we try to restore someone instead of a spirit of meekness with a haughty spirit, right? or if because of our pride or our judgment we don't restore such a one, what's the verse go on to say? Considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. We know that God doesn't bring temptation upon man. Right? God cannot tempt us to sin. But, be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. If we judge someone for a certain sin in their life, God may remove the hedge just to say, all right, devil, you can have everything but his life, like he did with Job. He may open the hedge a bit and say, Satan, you've asked me before, today you can tempt them with that thing. Why? Because we ought never think to esteem ourselves higher than anyone. We're supposed to esteem others better than ourselves. And part of the chastening may be that I have to learn that the hard way, that I have to get out in a fault so that somebody that I would have thought God never could have used comes by my way and restores me. Right? I've always been better at learning lessons hands-on, but there's some lessons I don't want to learn hands-on, Brother Randy. I remember the lesson you taught in the teens class one time. If you pray for patience, make sure you mean it. Right? Because learning patience, it takes, you know, it's going to hurt a little bit. That's a lesson. It's going to hurt to learn that one. Right? Some things we can only learn through hands on. But other things we can learn just, okay, meekness, restore in a spiritual manner. We care more about their need than maybe our inconvenience. Right? That is, we're not going to teach on that anymore, but very important verse. You know why most churches are a mess? A long time ago, people stopped being spiritual. Right? They may have become carnal. They may have become religious as the Pharisees, caught up in tradition and going through the motions. But all said and done, we weren't called to be pious. We were called to be Christ-like. His words had so much power on him because he was God. That he said, I am in the garden when he came to arrest me and knocked people over. Right? For, thir you know, for 33 and a half years, his whole de sole desire was to be as spiritual in the flesh as possible to show us that we c also can do it. Right? We can because he did it first. And where I fall lacking... The arm of flesh will fail me, but I can do all things through Christ. Right? Christ liveth in me. If I yield, he will. Okay, but verse number two. Bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. This isn't talking about restoring. This is talking about helping. Okay, restore something went wrong. But to bear a burden means somebody's still carrying it. They're still doing their best. But every now and then, we can tell when somebody's under a load, and then we can tell when somebody's about ready to be broken by the load. God will never put more on us than we can bear, but sometimes people put more on themselves 
than they can bear. Sometimes the world has just so beat up on people. Maybe families beat up on people. Maybe I beat up upon myself. And my burden, it's the same weight that it always been, but something that means change, I need a break. Right? Bible cautions us not to grow weary in well-doing. Right? You can weary yourself. But then sometimes the load isn't the problem. Sometimes the burden that people carry has nothing to do with what they're doing with Jesus. They've got a burden for God and they're still carrying that. But their burden that they may be, may be a burden of loneliness, may be a burden of discouragement. Right? Only you can do what God has called you to do for Him. That's why He gave it to you. But there are other burdens that will cause us to put our burden for God down. Right? Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. What was the law of Christ? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God, and thou shalt love the Lord thy or love thy neighbor as thyself. Esteeming others better than ourselves. When we become so invested in the work of God that we understand one bad day can be the difference between somebody staying in and falling out. And if they're under a burden, it may not I may not have to carry their load. Right? You may not have to. I'm, Brother Peter's wearing a green shirt and I saw him so we're going to use him as an example right Brother Peter may be going through a rough day rough week rough month I don't know but bearing his burden doesn't mean that on Sunday night you're going to go back there and say okay Brother Peter needed a week off I'm teaching this week that's not what this is talking that's his burden for God that's something that God birthed in his heart that's not what this verse is talking about but maybe he can't get up and teach with the compassion and with the you know desire that passion that God birthed in his heart because something else is weighing him down I can't fill his role mostly because he's bigger than me nobody can fill them shoes they're brother Peter's shoes okay I've, I've said just like that mural back on that wall we are But if Brother Peter's had a bad week, maybe it's just a text message. Hey, brother, I'm praying for you. I don't know what you're going through. God said I need to pray for you. Just want to let you know, you need anything, I'm here. That may be enough. Or it may be, brother, you may not have known this, but the sump pump went out in the basement. It's flooded. I'll be over with the shop back. Right? That may be the burden that I'm helping him bear. Right? It's not his spiritual work. I can't do that for you. You can't do that for me. Right? You cannot do what God birthed in my heart for me to do. But you can help me take care of the other stuff. The things that may rise up and try to interfere with what I'm trying to do for the Lord. Right? We are called to be spiritual people, but we live in a carnal world. Right? We still got to deal with the flesh. We got to deal with other people. Right? But by bearing those burdens for people, we can relieve them of the worries of the world so that they can continue to live for Christ. Right? The Philippian jailer could not go out and bear the Apostle Paul's burden to be, be them, you know, the apostle to the Gentiles, to be that great evangelist and missionary to go out and spread the gospel to those that were heathens, had nothing to do with God. Philippian jailer couldn't do that, but what did he do after he got saved? He took him to his own house. He cleaned his wounds. He said, I can't do what God's called you to do, but this I can help with. I may not know what's going on in your life. may not need to know. Right? But if I find out that you're hurting... Right? It's my responsibility. It is my duty to help bear the burdens that I can bear. Right? But then that leads us to verse number four. It says, But let every man prove his own work. And then shall they have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another, for every man shall bear his own burden. 
Well, hang on. Didn't it just say we're supposed to bear one another's burdens and now we're supposed to bear our burden? Well, yeah, it's, it's never the will of God for you to put your burden down. But those are, in context, talk about two different things. Bear one another's burdens so that they can continue to carry their burden for God. Verse number four is saying, let every man prove his own work, meaning the burden that God gave you for God's work. Right? The work that God wants to use you to do for the honor and glory of God. When it says let every man bear his own burden, you don't get out of carrying your burden for Christ because you're carrying somebody else's burden. Right? Anybody ever? Let's use an example. My lovely sister-in-law uses that awful thing called Facebook that our pastor preaches against all the time. And I don't know if it's her or Christian, but they bought a solid wood desk. Got a good price on it, but that stupid desk weighed 900 pounds. It came with a bookshelf. Bookshelf wasn't a problem. Bookshelf went right up steps on dolly. Wasn't a problem. Well, desk, it tries to go up the steps, and uh, not good. Not good. Right? And I got a bad back to start with. Okay, but hey, we got it up there. Problem was, it was too big to fit through the doors. Okay? So then I said, well, you got a pry bar? He said, no. And I, he said, I'll just ask Dad to come over on Monday. So Monday, Dad went over with the pry bar. He took part of the door frame off. They got the sucker in the room. Okay? But just because I went and did that all day doesn't mean that when I get home, that was on Saturday, I believe, doesn't mean that when I get home, I get out of studying my Sunday school lesson to make sure that I've got the will and mind of God for Sunday morning. Well, Lord, physically, I'm beat. Right? I'm not kidding you. We got that thing to the top of steps, and I was white as it goes about big. I was pouring with everything I had on the top of the dolly. Christian was lifting with everything that he had, just trying to get it one step up at a time. Right? It's a pain. Christian said, I'm allowed to when they, if, you know, if they ever move out of that house that I'm allowed to cut the thing in half, throw it out the window, and set it on fire. So that's what I'm going to do. And it'll be fun. But the whole point is helping bear somebody else's burden. It's an honorable thing. It's a spiritual thing. It's something that's Christ-like for us to do. But it does not alleviate us of our responsibilities for what we have to do. Right? God gave me a burden, and just because I care about somebody else doesn't mean that I'm freed from my responsibilities. Right? There have been many a days that I've seen growing up that the pastor had a very bad Saturday, but yet that didn't you know, relieve him of his duty to get the mind of God for Sunday morning. Right? I may choose to help you bear your burden, but that doesn't give me an excuse to neglect my own burden. Likewise, if somebody else offers to help bear my burden, it doesn't mean that I just unshoulder the whole thing and say, okay, have fun for a while. No, somebody may help me bear my burden, but I'm still supposed to be bearing my burden. It's not just, well, if I take up somebody else's, that means I get to put mine down. No, no, no. But also, if somebody else offers to bear yours, it doesn't mean that you just say, okay, here it is, and then leave them to do what God called you to do. Not going to happen that way. Right? God may call somebody away, but if God calls somebody away and they had a responsibility in the church, God will supply someone to fill that void before that person is called away of God. Because it's never God's will that the ministry suffers as a result of a person. Right? God may give you a new burden, but until God takes the other burden from me, I'm going to pull them both. Every man pulls his burden. Right? A lot of the modern day thinking is that you can do what God wants you to do when you want to do it. When it's convenient for you. And I've said for years now, spirituality is not a day by day thing. It's not a month by month thing. It's a second by second thing. Why do you think we're supposed to pray without ceasing? So that we're always spiritually in tune with what the Spirit wants us to do so that we can continue to remain spiritual. 
Right? It's God's will that we are spiritual all the time. You're not spiritual if you put down your burden that God gave you. That's why whether I'm helping somebody else or somebody else is helping me, I'm still holding on to that burden and carrying it for God. People may help me by alleviating burdens of the flesh. Right? God forbid you find out that I don't have enough money to put gas in my tank. God gives you a burden to, you know, hey, man, $5 bill. Not out in public, just in, says, hey, brother, love you, appreciate it. God said you need this. Right? If God put that on your heart, hallelujah, that may alleviate me of that burden of the flesh or of the carnal man. I needed that to get to work tomorrow, get the paycheck, fill the rest of it up. Okay, which isn't the case because I don't get paid on Mondays. But just because that burden has been, it doesn't mean, ah, oh, finally, I can take a break and put everything down. What if right after that, I'm going through a drive through that God wants me to hand a tract to somebody as watering a seed that somebody else is already planting, and as a result of me saying, you know what, I'm just taking the rest of the day off. That person may never get the water that God wanted to send to them. Right? What if I won't run into somebody that God wants to use me to minister to, but Lord, I'm too tired. I've been bearing burdens all day. Doesn't alleviate me of the fact that I've still got a burden to carry. Right? But then, verse number three, for if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. Right? If a man thinketh he stand, let him take heed lest he fall. Pride goes before destruction, haughty spirit before fall. Right? If we think that oh, I can handle whatever the devil throws my way, you may think that until the devil throws something your way. It's not about what I can handle. It's about what God can use me to do. I am the instrument. I am not the master craftsman. Right? I am the tool. I'm not the one that's doing the digging, the planting, and the watering. Right? Some plant and some water. Okay? Really what that's saying is God may use you to plant. You may be a spade. You may be a watering can. But you're not the one doing the work. You're just trying to be faithful to do what God has called you to do. If you start thinking that you're more than what you are, God may let you find out how little you really are. Amen. It's a humbling experience, but it also may break you. A lot of people have been humbled by God only to realize I was wrong all along, and then they become ashamed. And as a result of the shame, they let themselves fall out. Right? Shame on those that are spiritual for not restoring such a one in a spirit of meekness to say, hey, you may have had thing, you may have had the rug pulled out from underneath of you because you were standing on something other than what God. I don't care about that. Let's get you back to the house of God. Let's get you some help. Right? Let's get you where the Balm of Gilead is. Let's get you where the Rose of Sharon is. Let's get you back to Jesus because he can do it. I can't, but I can get you to where it is. Right, I may be able to clean you up a little bit, may be able to give you a little bit of food, but I can't do the work, but I can get you to the place where the master is. But all that being said, look, if you will, in verse number four, but let every man prove his own work. We've already gotten it. You don't get away from the work that God wants you to do just because you may be helping somebody else. Just because somebody offers to help you, it doesn't alleviate you with the truth that you have to go out and do the work that God called you to do we are written epistles known and read of all men we ought to strive that every chapter that's written every day looks as much like Christ as it can right? that should be the desire that's the goal that's what verse number 4 says let every man prove his own work now when I read you know, we know that the Bible is profitable for doctrine for reproof. Okay? What's reproof? That's correction. That's not disproof. Okay? Let every man prove his own work. We can prove something to somebody else. Well, what's that? That's evidence. Okay? Well, I don't believe that that happened. Well, here's the receipt. Here's the video. Here's the picture. That's not what this is talking about. Not prove your own work as in showing somebody else the truth behind it. Let every man prove his own work 
I think of the old pirate ships, right? The old wooden sails, you know, wooden sailed ships had them big old cannons on it. And there's a process that they go through called proofing. Okay, before it gets the stamp on it that says it was made here and we certify, you know, every today firearms have stamps on them to show that it went through the testing process. Right? What do those stamps mean? Well, they tell you who made it, when it was made, and then the most important one is that it was proved. Or it was proofed. With the old cannons, what they would do is they'd load it up like they were just getting ready to shoot a normal cannonball, but they'd put about two or three times the amount of gunpowder in it that it should have had. And they say, all right, everybody hit the deck. We're getting ready to like this thing. Well, why'd they do it? Because they didn't have the understanding of you know, metallurgy and how to forge things and how to, back then, they would make a mold and they'd pour the cast, you know, they'd cast it out of the metal. Sometimes it's bronze, sometimes it's iron. But whatever it was, when it came out, they said, well, we don't know how that whole process went. We don't have x-ray vision. There could be bubbles in there where air got trapped. Then that, that's a weakness. And under pressure, that may cause a crack or it may cause a fracture. And then if that happens whole thing's going to explode. So they said, well, let's just nip it in the bud and figure out if this thing's really going to hold up. So let's pack it with a whole lot more than it should be able to handle or what it's going to be used at every day. And if it can handle that, it's not going to be, this little charge, not going to be a problem. Right? This tiny bit of gunpowder, not going to be an issue because it already handled this big bit and we know that there's no flaws in it anymore. And if it passed the test, they'd get the little hammer out, they'd stamp it and say, seal of approval. As long as you treat this thing right, as long as you don't let it get rusty, as long as you don't, you know, allow it to, you know, when copper, when it oxidizes, it turns green like the Statue of Liberty. They say, as long as you don't let that happen to it, this thing is going to work. Because we proved it. Well, how does that translate to your work for Christ? Right? There may be days... That there's not going to be somebody around to help you bear your burden. Right? That's Job. Job had some friends stop by, but instead of bearing his burden, they piled on a whole lot more. Right? They came to judge, came to ridicule, say, Job, what in the world, what sin did you commit for God to punish you this badly? And then Job kind of went off on them. Said, I didn't do nothing different. Right? But yet. This came my way. I need to deal with it. Y'all ain't helping. Right? There are going to be times in your life that you feel like, Lord, I can't take any more. What is that? That's to prove your work to other people. Not to you. If God birthed it in your heart, you know that God gave it to you. There's no doubt about that. But there are going to be times when let every man prove his own work... I can't expect somebody else to go through the hardness of proving my work. Right? You don't say, well, we're going to proof this cannon, so let's take one off the wall and put the charge in that. That doesn't do anything for this cannon. You don't know anything about this cannon. You don't know if it can take the pressure. You don't know if it's got any flaws in it. Proving is an experience as much for me as it is for other people. I get to find out if there are some cracks along the way. I get to find out if there are some spots that the Lord needs to go back and put me in the fire again to get rid of those air bubbles, get rid of those defects that if, under pressure, you went to go fire me off as a cannon, I'd crack, I'd explode. I'd cause more damage to those around me than those that God was pointing me at. The process of proofing happens long before you ever go into service. But they don't proof cannons on the battlefield. On the battlefield, you expect this to do its job. You don't want any doubt about it. You don't want to have to sit there and think, well, I don't know if this thing's going to you know, hold together if we light it. No, you want to have faith in what you know, you've been equipped with. Right? They do this, did the same thing for muskets back in the day, too. You don't want to, want, eh, this thing might explode in my hand if I pull the trigger. That ain't going to do you any good on a battlefield. Likewise, long before God can ever commission you to do 
and to be an exemplar of, hast thou considered my servant Job? Right? You've got to be proofed. You've got to endure something that you thought you couldn't endure before to understand that, you know, my strength, not good, but God's strength is made perfect in my weakness. I'm a whole lot stronger in Him than I ever could be on my own. And to understand that, I may have to go through some proofing. Lord, that's a whole lot of gunpowder. I don't think I'm going to be able to handle it. God says, no, you can't handle it, but I can. Proofing or proving our work to somebody else is to show that the only person I need is God. It's not about me. Not about anybody else. It's about what God chooses to do in my life. That's why it says, the verse goes on to say, and then he shall have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. Meaning, I cannot expect somebody else to do for me what God called me to do. But if somebody else were to do it, when we got to heaven, the reward would go to that person, not to me. I wasn't a servant. I was a failure. I didn't go through the proofing process. God couldn't use me because I wasn't certified that I could handle what God wanted to do in my life. Proving my work is to show that there's no flaw in my spirituality. Right? If something were, you know, it fell on a day. If I had a day like Job, if I've been proved, if my work's been proven, it's not going to impact what I do for God each and every day. It's not going to impact the call that God's put on my life. It's not going to impact the work that God may have entrusted me with. It's been proved. Everything else may fall apart, but I'm going to keep going on for God. Proving is as much to me. Nobody ever saw those stamps, by the way, once you put them into carts. Once, most of the time on the barrel of a gun, it's hidden under, if it's an you know, old musket, it was underneath of the wood. right? Or nowadays, if they put stamps on them, it's with all the mechanisms in it, the barrel goes inside the rest of the gun. You don't see it. It's not for everybody else to see and go, oh, I can trust that. It was for the person that assembled the gun or assembled the cannon to show them this has gone through the process. God's trying to put us together so that we can go out and be used. He's assembling us, and a lot of us have all the wheels. Right, well, Lord, I'll go wherever you want me to go. We're ready to roll out. Other people, all right, Lord, I got all the cannonballs, got all the gunpowder. I've got that little stick with the wick on the end of it to burn drill slow so we can light this thing. Right, or in newer cannons, all right, Lord, my finger's on the trigger. There's only one problem. The barrel hadn't been proved. Can't be installed yet. Because the master's looking at the barrel and saying, Well, where's I haven't put my stamp of approval on this. Till we test this, until it's been proved, I can't send it out to be used. There are a lot of Christians that say, All right, Lord, I'm ready to go, but we're not ready to be proved. We don't want to endure the hardness of, okay, Lord, show me how much we really can't handle. All right, Lord, show me a time of hardness so that I can understand, regardless of how bad it gets, what you have fashioned me into isn't going to break under pressure. You want to know why there are very few Elijahs or Elishas or Jeremiahs, Isaiahs, very few Davids, man, after God's own heart? Because people don't like being proved. It's not being proved to others. It's evident. Right? You hear... Somebody say, hey, fire in the hole, and you pull a cord or you go to light it and the cannon explodes, hey, that thing didn't have what it took. A lot of people have just imploded over the years. They claim to be Christian, and their life turned into a mess because they never let God prove them. But then it's also very evident when you say, all right, fire, and then the round goes down range. The cannon may get a little bit of kickback, that's why you never stand behind the cannon when it's getting ready to go off. Recoil. Right, even nowadays, you see the you know, massive ones that they have on ships. You get inside, there's a whole big arm that's shooting back. You don't stand behind it when they say fire. Right? There may be blowback in your life, but it doesn't break you. You're ready to be put back up on the line again and fired again. No doubt that that cannon's going to do what the man that commissioned it 
wanted it to do. Really what those seals were were guarantees. Those proofing marks. The person that made it said, I guarantee that as long as you use it for what I say to use it for, you ain't going to have any problems. I guarantee, I put my name on it. That was the first marker. Who made it? It was their logo, their symbol. It says, this was made by me. It was made to do this, and we tested it, and it's good to go. Well, there are a lot of churches put faith in people that God didn't say were good to go. They imploded. Did a whole lot of damage to the people around them. Did very little for the work of God. There are other people, maybe quiet, maybe humble. Looking at them, you'd think, well, what in the world has that person ever done? But little do you know, they've been proved in that secret place where they get and they pray with God. And they've done far more for the cause of Christ than people that will end up on TV or on radio stations or anything else. Because they, they said, Lord, you've proved me. I may not be able to do that, but I know that I can do this. And whatever comes my way, you can still use me. Whether I ever know what's going on or how it's going to end out in the long run. And they said, but I can handle this. And you've showed me that I can handle it. I'm just going to do that for you. Because I love you. And that's what you called me to do. Proving your work. You're not proving it to other people. You're proving it and saying, Lord, I'll, I'll go through whatever testing you want so that you are satisfied with me and you put the stamp on there that says, I guarantee that Brother Brian is going to stand up. That Brother Bob is going to be able to stand whatever comes his way. Right, that you are going to be a okay at the end of the battle, at the end of the war. When we get to heaven, God's going to say, I wanted you to be a cannon, and he's just a cannon. You know, cannons don't get to decide where they're pointing, when they're fired. They don't get to look through the binoculars and find out what happened after they were fired. They're just supposed to be a cannon. Right, proving my work. I don't care how the Lord uses whatever I do for Him. I just care about doing it the way that He wants me to do it. All I care about is being proved unto God. We heard about it from our pastor, a workman that needed not to be ashamed. I get in the Word of God so I know what God wants me to do, how God wants me to do it. And then I live it so I can be proved unto God, not unto man. That's why I don't care if other people think, well, why, why'd you go and help that person? Because they needed help. But that person didn't deserve it. Well, I didn't deserve Christ. But I will restore such one in the spirit of meekness. One, because if God told me to do it, that settles it. But two, we restore because we don't know what God can do with broken pieces. Right, the church, the Bible says it'll always have a remnant. We're the ragtag. We're not the whole beautiful tapestry. We're just a remnant. The off scour of the world that nobody else wanted anything to do with. But God said, I can do something with that. The master said, it may just be clay, but I can turn it into a nice piece of pottery. Maybe some porcelain. Right, the world said, we've got no use for this. And God said, I'll prove to you that with me, they can do anything but it all comes down to me being willing to say, all right, Lord, put me in the proving chamber again. Let me prove myself that I can handle it. And just because I'm being proved and I may be going through it, it doesn't mean that I get to put down the burden. It doesn't mean that if somebody else offers to help that I just shuck all my responsibility on them because then they're going to get the stamp that says that they've been proved to handle all that. Now, I want to be used to God, so I have to go through the proving process. And if you take a day off, you may have to start the process over again. And if you put down your burden, God may never let you take it up again. So that, verse number four, he shall have rejoicing in himself alone. You ever just have them days that you don't know how you did it, but you're just thankful that God did it for you? That's what that verse is talking It's not saying, look what I did. No, no, no. Look what God did in my life. 
He didn't use the preacher to do it, didn't use somebody else to do it. He used me, and I don't know how he did it, but I'm look at what God did. But it brings honor and glory, and glory, not to me, but to him. One of these days, hopefully, we get to heaven, we hear, well done, good and faithful servant. That's when we'll have rejoicing. But right now, all the praise, honor, and glory goes to him. It's not about how much I can endure. It's about when I endure, how much God can use me to do. Proving. Not enjoyable. Right? Not always the most complex situation. We're just going to load this thing with gunpowder, gun light it off, and see what happens. Not complex. But as a result of it, God may put His seal of approval on you. Others may know that person he went through it God was with him he's been proved you can trust that guy because God's put him through the fire he came out the other side of what God wanted him to be if we let God prove us don't tell him what God can use us to do but we got to be willing to say alright Lord load me up with gunpowder doesn't matter how much it doesn't matter if I break we can start over again because you're the one that does all things well. I don't want to be junk. I don't want to be the thing that's flawed. Break me and make me into something that's unflawed. That would be our desire. If that's what we truly desire, then we're really scratching the surface of being spiritual, going out and being used of God. If you enjoyed today's message, head on over to ibcforums.com and click on sermons. And don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast. As always, thanks for listening.